Good? Okay. So, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, um, to have been a participant in several of these FRG conferences uh, over the years, and I think I've definitely gotten a lot out of the experience. So, what I want to talk to you about today is um, the comparison problem in the theory of infinity and categories, and what kind of problem? the comparison problem. So, comparing different um. ideas of what an infinity n category should be. This is joint work um, with Clark Barwick. And you can read about it on the archive if you're so inclined. Zero, zero, four, zero. So, there's sort of two questions that I want to talk about. Um, and to really understand the significance of this, I want to give you sort of a picture of what the landscape looked like before uh, Clark and I started working on this. So this is connected to sort of two questions. So one question you can ask is, what is, what is an infinity one category? What actually does that mean? And related questions, what is an infinity n category? And another question which will be very important for us to try to understand, which is related, is the question of <laughs> what is a homotopy theory? And there are different answers to both questions. So let me start with this question. What is a homotopy theory? What is an abstract homotopy theory? And because even here there's many different answers and it's kind of interesting to compare. And what I'm eventually going to talk about is, is axioms for the homotopy theory of infinity n categories. So this is very relevant. So if you go and ask a homotopy theorist what an abstract homotopy theory is you'll get different answers depending on who you ask. So one answer you might hear is that a homotopy theory is a equivalent model category. So what exactly is that structure? Well, it consists of a category, M, and it consists of uh, three classes of maps. You have cofibrations, you have vibrations and you have a class of weak equivalences. So the maps are strings of length two, though, right? You get a string of length two is called a co-fibration, or a string of length two is called a vibration. So not just individual maps. Okay. Yeah, no, they're individual maps. So um, like for the model category of some pushful sets, an inclusion, a monomorphism, that will be a cofibration. And a fibration is a map which satisfies a certain lifting property with respect to certain, certain cofibrations. Um, that's just one example. Um, well, I don't think that's the right point of view, though, because those are just examples where you have enough geometry where you can recognize geometric mm -hmm. things, but there's the idea, if you just know the maps of the homotopy, you need a string of two maps and a string to know what the fiber is or what the cofiber is. You want to characterize those homotopy. And this is, I think, would be very kind of geometric. Well, it's, it's not very abstract. Well, that's just my you opinion. Do, okay. You get different opinions. Yeah, you get different opinions. So, you know, maybe, yeah. I mean, so. Every year when I give my graduate course, I try uh -huh. to understand better what a vibration is. So. Yeah. Well, and they're, they're, you know, this is just a, you know, so, okay, yeah. So I'm about to go even weaker than this. So this is some particular structure. So maybe you'll be more happy with slightly less structure. So another possibility is what is called a homotopical category. I should just write that over here.
So this is just a category and a collection of weak equivalences, which satisfy the two out of six property. So that means if you have three composable maps, F, G, and H, if the composite, um, if these two composites are in W, then everything's in W. So, one of the structures that you get from a Quillen model category is you get a good notion of, of homotopy co-limits, homotopy limits, derived functors, mapping spaces between objects. You get a whole bunch of structure. And it was sort of a, a point which was very much emphasized by, um, by the work of Bill Dwyer and Dan Kahn that you don't actually need all of this additional structure, the co-fibrations and the fibrations, to extract that kind of data. You can, get, you can often get away with much less structure, um, often just with a category with, which has some class of weak equivalences. In fact, you can even get away with less. So relative categories are just a category and a subcategory of weak equivalences. And the only requirement is that it will contain all identities. So every object is in W. And if you have a relative category, then there's a process by which you can obtain mapping spaces between objects. So this is the category of of simplicial categories. So th they're categories enriched in simplicial sets. And given a relative category, a category with a class of weak equivalences, you can form the hammock localization and get out of that a simplicial category. And the same the in front of localization? hammock localization. I'll write that down. And it's because you uh, you want to figure out what the mapping space is uh, for between two objects. What you do is you sort of look at you know. So the morphisms. If you just did a sort of naive localization, inverted the classes, you would you would have things which look like zigzags of morphisms where the reverse arrows are in W of some length. For the hammock localization, you do a similar thing when instead of modding out by these guys, you now build a simplicial gadget where you can have sort of zigzag, you know, you can have sort of grids of these zigzags. Oops. These guys are all in here, and these guys are in the weak equivalences. And you don't mod out the maps, you just build this enormous, some push hole thing. And it's very hard to. That's one, oh, you, so you make building a I'm, map there. Right, I'm building, I'm taking a relative category and building now a category that has some push hole sets between the objects. It's kind of hard to work with, that particular construction, but you could, in principle, do it. Um, and somehow extract just from very basic data some kind of uh, some kind of uh, well some kind of a something that you might call homotopy theory. You at least have objects and spaces of maps between them. If you just if it comes from a model category, do you get the same thing? Yeah. So there are other yeah, and there are theorems about this. If suppose you had a, a model category, um, there's a simplicial model. Cat well, yeah. Suppose you have a model category. Um, you often it's often the case that it's a simplicial model category. So you have good Hom spaces. Um, 
just using the structure of the model category, not using this crazy hammock localization. And you can ask, does that give me the same, the same simplicial category? And well, it doesn't give you the identical simplicial category, but it gives you one which is equivalent in a certain sense that the mapping spaces will be, will be this equivalent. Or it gives you the correct mapping spaces, this construction. It's a functor. It's a functor. It's a functor. So if you have a, a map which preserves the weak equivalences, then, then you get this functor. One, one sort of hint that the Quillen model category structure might be a little overkill is that when you, when you I mean, what's a map of Quillen model categories? Well, there's a the notion of a, a Quillen adjunction, and there's notions of Quillen equivalences. But it's not, it's not a functor which preserves the structure. It doesn't preserve the cofibrations or the fibrations or even the weak equivalences in general. It's just a map which preserves some artifact of the structure. So somehow having all this extra structure is useful for computing things, but, it doesn't, but it's not sort of exactly the structure that you want. It's sort of extra stuff that is built, tacked onto your homotopy theory to allow you to do more kinds of computations. So a Quillen adjunction, I don't want to define it. It's a, a junction between model categories that preserves some amount of the structure, not all of it. So. All right. Any comment about it? What was the comment? The comment was that it doesn't preserve all the structure. It preserves some of the structure. So. Do you want to make a definition that extracts that part of the structure? That exactly. The structure? Something which just captures the essential bit. And essentially, you can get everything that you want out of just the weak equivalences. You can get homotopy co-limits, homotopy limits, everything that you usually think about can be extracted from the weak equivalences. Not very easily, but it's possible. Um, Another candidate, you know, so you. Every clone model category, I know all the objects have cohomology and some analog of homotopy. Well. Is that true for any clone model category? And then I wanted to ask if, if that's missing or not in the generalization you're considering. Whether you have cohomology, homotopy, and obstruction theory, which is kind of the way I recognize. What a homo yeah, so there are, there are cool model categories which are very unusual, um, but they all have a, a sense, they all have like a homotopy theory, and you can at least... Um, and an obstruction theory, kind of? Kind of. I mean, you might have, you might not always have, you can start to ask questions like, can I build a Posnikov tower? And, you know, is there something like, um, something which plays the role of the, you know, the eilenberg mclean spaces right. that, you know, and... Uh, and it may, you know, maybe it doesn't have them, or maybe it doesn't have enough of them for you to do everything you'd want to do. But you can formulate the, the ideas. Yeah, and so there's a there's a notion of um, uh, Quillen cohomology that's something which you can work in most model category situations. It's very analogous to homology than in the way that you usually think about it. You look at you try to look at abelian group objects in your model category and put a model structure on that. It's like some push abelian groups, and then you can sort of do stuff with that. I want to go in a different direction. I want to talk about another proposal for what a homotopy theory was, and this is due to Charles Rask. He said, well, okay, suppose that I have some abstract notion of what a homotopy theory is. I should be able to extract certain kinds of data out of that. So, if I have some crazy homotopy theory, I, <laughs> well, that's, that's one crazy possibility, but it could be some imagine other, any other, imagine any other one. Okay. I can extract from that, um, I should be able to extract from that uh, what you might call a moduli space. Of objects, or you might call it you might call it a classifying space 
of objects. So this, so in the regular homotopy category of spaces, this will look like a particular space, and then um, it's sort of, and then it's space of self-homotopy equivalences, and it'll be it'll be a bunch of different components, and so exactly. So maps, right? So if I have an ordinary, so this is some space, and if I have a, a map to this, I'm going to have like a bundle, a fiber bundle, a fiber a vibration, whose fibers are sort of the objects of this homotopy theory in some, in some sense. And you should be able to do a similar thing for moduli spaces of maps. And another similar thing for pairs of maps, pairs of composable maps between spaces. And assemble these into a bunch of spaces. And there are various maps. If you have a map, you can have two objects. So you have maps like that. And the data you extract out of here is some simplicial space. And it satisfies a variety of axioms, which we say is a complete Siegel space. So let me put that down here. And of course, there are ways to relate these things. There is a nice functor from relative categories to these complete Siegel spaces. Where? Can you recall what a complete Siegel space is? Which yeah, I will. And just, uh, okay. yeah, I will. Because it brings us over to the other side of the board. So let me leave this for a second and go over here. I'll come back to the Siegel space in just a minute. So. I want to think about what an infinity category is and what an infinity n category is. And I also want to think about what a category is. So if we have a, an ordinary category, then we can extract a simplicial set but called the nerve of the category. So it goes to this nerve. And so what does this nerve consist of? Well, this is the set of objects. The first space is the, the set of morphisms. And of course, a morphism has two maps to the objects. and uh, and so on. N2 is going to be, N2 of C is going to be, you can think of it as functors from 2 into C. So 2, there's a, this category which is a poset, it just has 0, 1, and 2. You think of it as a poset or as a category that looks like that. So a functor from that into C is just a pair of composable arrows. And by restricting to either those two arrows or to their composite, I get three maps. And this continues, and you get a simplicial set in this way, called the nerve. And you can characterize the, those simplicial sets, which are the nerves of categories, in the following way. You can look at, you can look at, um, Let's just do it for N2, so NC2. You have two maps to, to the morphisms. So this is a pair of morphisms. You can say, well, let's look at the first morphism. And let's look at the last morphism. Okay? Those two morphisms agree uh, when you look at their common object, the source of the first one. And the target, or excuse me, the target of the first one and the source of the last one. So you get a commuting diagram like that. And this is, in fact, a pullback square. To give a pair of commuting arrows is just to give, or of composable arrows is just to give these two arrows. In set theory. In pullback diagram. Is yeah, yeah, there's a simplicial set. Yeah, yeah. 
these are all sets. Right. So. so just as I just thought of something that make, really emphasizes my point about model categories. So this is really a fun fact, uh, maybe an exercise, that um, I'll write it down even. It really, it really shows that this really is doesn't capture what you want. So this is what? It is gonna, I'm, okay, so here's a, here's a little, here's a little uh, theorem. Oh, this captures what you want. Yeah, on, on the category of sets, there exists exactly nine model structures. Yeah, so model categories don't really capture what you want. And there's sort of, up to Kuhlin equivalents, there are three different ones. So one of them has like six different incarnations as a model category, even though it really is one homotopy theory. So this is really overkill in terms of the amount of data that you want. If you did it... So there are three different homotopy theories. So three different, three different homotopy theories. Um, but those get divided up into nine different model structures. Um, there's exactly three. Um, so there's zero categories, minus one categories, minus two categories. There's zero types, minus one types, and minus two types. Um, and those are exactly the three homotopy categories that you would expect on the category of sets. So, so what? So model categories are sort of not, they don't really capture exactly the structure that you want. That's well, my point. For example, using sets, you can build simplicial sets and do homotopy theory with that. Well, this is just the easiest, you know, sets are sort of a m very primitive example of a category. If you have a more complicated category, like simplicial sets or spaces, you know, you could imagine, if, if even the category of sets has nine different model structures, it's sort of hopelessly complicated what the different model structures are, and they don't really capture what you're, what you're after. They don't really capture the homotopy theory, necessarily. So that's all I wanted to say. Okay, back to this point, to, uh, to the main thread. So we have um, categories. So you, you, you're absolutely right. I misspoke. It's not that they don't capture the homotopy theory. It's that they do capture it. They capture it very well, but they also have a lot of extra stuff that's not really that's not really, you might not consider it part of the homotopy theory. It's I mean, maybe extra. Could you recapitulate that remark? What's that? Could you recapitulate that remark? Yeah, so the remark was that it's not that model categories don't capture the homotopy theory. They do capture it. I, think I misspoke. They do capture the homotopy theory, but they actually... They're wearing tuxedos while they do it. Exactly. They capture, they capture, they're wearing tuxedos while they do it. They capture a lot, a lot, they have a whole lot of extra fancy machinery and stuff that's there that's not really part of the, the homotopy okay. theory. Okay, you know. so how many of them give zero types? How many of them give zero types? Um, that's the one which I think has six different <laughs> model categories. I think, yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so this is a category. So category can be thought of as a simplicial object in sets satisfying this condition. Oh. Yeah, I, this is fully faithful. So. so infinity category, it should be some kind of, some sort of category, so a higher category with morphisms at all levels but they should be invertible above above n that's sort of the heuristic version of what an infinity n category should be how do you capture that Well, even for infinity one, 
It's sort of a question. How do you express that? So one way to think about it, another, there's multiple ways to think about categories. So one way is to think, okay, well, category, you have objects, and then you have these sets of morphisms. It's an object where you have mapping sets. So in infinity one category, between two objects, you should have a mapping infinity zero category. So, what's in it? so this is an infinity category where everything is invertible. So there's a basic principle which goes under the name of the homotopy hypothesis. And what does it say? It says that Infinity groupoids are the same as spaces. Or rather, a more refined version says well, there should be a homotopy theory of infinity n categories or infinity 1 categories. And the infinity groupoids, the homotopy theory of infinity groupoids should be the same as the homotopy theory of spaces. And uh, another thing you could say, another aspect of that is if you just look at n groupoids, so if you truncate at a particular level, if everything's just trivial above a particular level, that should be the same as n types. And you all know this. This is supposed to be trivial above some level. So, uh, like, a, like, let's do a particular example: one groupoids. So then I just mean ordinary one groupoids. So it means that um, above n. You know, an infinity group void is supposed to have morphisms at all levels. So above n, it's just identities. Oh. So it's a way to regard any n group void as a particular instance of an infinity group void. And in the special case n equals 1, this is sort of, there's a well known way to implement this. If you have a space x, you can map it to its fundamental group void. And that recovers all the information about the one type of x. And there's a similar statement for, for two types using the usual notion of two categories. And so this is sort of a, the, a desired criteria for any theory of n categories. Most of the theories of infinity n categories build this into the foundations. So n times b, it only has the first n homotopy groups? Yeah. And then above zero? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you can, there are two ways to think about it. You can think, you can think that there's a homotopy theory which has all spaces and a a weak equivalence is a map which induces an isomorphism on the first n homotopy groups. Oh, That's another way to, to say what the homotopy theory is. Um, okay. So, Chris? yes? Uh, this characterization of the nerve. Yeah. Is that, uh, do you want something similar for higher end? Yeah, yeah. And so this leads to the, um, at least to two different notions. So, um, well, let me let me first do Siegel category. So a Siegel category has objects, which are it has a set of objects. And then for any two morphisms, for any two objects, excuse me, x and y, you have, you have a, a mapping space. Let me call this C. C, this is a, this is a space of maps. Now you can assemble all of these. You can take the disjoint union over all x and y. I'll call that C1. So then C1 has a map to this discrete discrete object, C0, has two maps, source and target. And in addition to a space of maps, you also have, um, for every x, y, and z, you have another space, x, y, z. And these things assemble into a simplicial space. So, we get a simplicial space. And 
And they're required to satisfy the following Siegel condition, which says that if I take, if I take my space in level n, I can now project it onto the different factors, the C1 factors. You're assuming the maps form spaces? Is I'm assuming, yeah, because I want to capture what an infinity one category is. So it's something. You're assuming the maps form spaces. Yeah, these are going to be equal to spaces. Oh, they're infinity zero. Yeah, yeah they're infinity zero categories, which you sort of build in this hypothesis. So now in the In the set version, the ordinary category version, in the ordinary category version, this was an isomorphism of sets. But in this version, we don't really, we want to be able to have weak compositions. So this is just going to be a homotopy equivalence. So is a Siegel category a category with a special property, or is there additional data? It's additional data because you have, because you have this space right here. The space is going to be so the space C of X, Y, Z is going to be equivalent to the space C of X, Y cross, um, you know, you have a map like this, which is a equivalence to C of Y, Z, but it's not equal to this. And so then you have a map down here to C of XZ, which is a sort of composition. So how does this capture a weak composition? Well, in order to, in order to write down a composition, you'd have to choose a, a homotopy inverse to this map. And then you could, then you could write down what an explicit composition is. But there's, so this kind of builds in a contractible space of compositions in an implicit way. It's a clever way of building in some kind of contractible space of compositions without having to... You need to ask a stupid question, yeah. why is that a contractible space? These choices. Well, uh, you want me to say, oh, so you get this first, you have a map, and then you have, that's a homotopy equivalence, and you want to look at the space of homotopy inverse equivalences. Like, but all that's like all the maps homotopic to a given map. Uh, uh, so you, you need to, yeah, it is if you specify also the fact that it's a home, like you have to specify the, comp, the homotopy between the compositions in both ways, and then it will be a contractible space. The inverse includes the homotopy of the composition. Exactly, yeah, it's not just that it exists. The inverse yeah, and then it, will, then it will be a contractible space. Yeah. So, this gives you two different, there are actually two different model structures on this. There's sort of a projective model structure and an injective model structure. And there are some coolant adjunctions, coolant equivalences between these. So, this is work by Bergner, some very good work. So there are coolant adjunctions, which look right coolant functors, which look like this. So this is just a di this is a diagram of of just the right coolant equivalences. So a coolant equivalence has arrows in both directions. I'm just drawing one of the directions. Okay, okay, where do I want to go? So a complete Siegel space is similar, only instead of, instead of a set of objects, you have a space of objects. And you have a similar Siegel condition. So it's a different way of organizing the same data. And there's another, another answer to what a homotopy theory is or what 
an infinity category is you start to see that these are really kind of capturing the same thing. A category enriched in spaces is also very similar to the notion of an infinity one category. There's another one which is very useful, which is more well known, made probably to a lot of the people here. So quasi categories form one of these model categories. And let me just continue to add in some of the um, some of the coolant, some of the known coolant equivalences between these. So there are right coolant functors in both directions for these guys. And there's a bunch of right coolant functors between these guys, like that. So these are sort of like very, these are the uh, most popular uh, definitions of what an infinity one category is. You know, different people prefer different of these, sometimes like quasi categories or complete Siegel spaces. They're all equivalent because you can see that everything's connected by a coolant equivalence. Uh, this isn't a coolant equivalence, but it is equivalence of relative categories. So that's one thing. There are model categories in all of these. There's a model category structure on these relative categories. Well, those are six infinity one categories. Well, these are six model categories that model the homotopy theory of infinity one categories. Oh. So. You kind of one other uh, homotopy theory of infinity zeros. So that would be an example, like you, there's a, there's a simplicial category of, of spaces, there's a relative category of spaces, there's a quasi category of spaces, you can model it in any one of these so guys. What do you mean? What's that? I mean, I thought that's what you meant, so that's infinity zero. Infinity zero. So these are, these are. I'm having trouble getting to the level, the right, right. level. I mean, these are homotopy theories of these are homotopy theories modeling all infinity one categories. Is that? For the homotopy theory of infinity one categories. Oh, oh, so, oh, oh, infinity one category can have a homotopy theory. Exactly. So, well, oh, there's a homotopy theory of infinity one categories, just like there's a homotopy theory of spaces. I don't see, I don't see how you jump that level up on the end. I thought we were doing mm -hmm. spaces, essentially. And then homotopy theory. I mean, just doing homotopy theory in a category. It's a category of infinity one categories? There's a model category is of infinity one categories. Category of infinity one categories. Yep. And in fact, there's six. There's, huh? And then there's six of them right here. What? There's six different ones that you can choose. And they're all equivalent, but as you can see, there's lots of different ways you could pass from one to another. You could go over here, then down here, then back up by the left adjoint. joint. But still don't. I don't know at the right level, because what is the weak equivalence? Any one of these. Can you give me an example of infinity one category of weak equivalence between two of them? So an example would be like the. Two examples of infinity one categories and a weak equivalence between. Those okay. Two. Okay, I know. I know examples. Yeah, you know examples. Okay, I don't want to okay. get sidetracked too far. Uh, yeah, but I, so what I'm trying to capture is the homotopy theory of infinity one categories. I mean the number six here doesn't have to do with the number six you mentioned before. No, it's just six examples. There are more examples than six. <laughs> um, okay. So, so it, it, it. so there's there's a similar thing for infinity n too. I want to. Yeah, we just, the one categories are in this diagram. They're the objects of these categories. So the point is that there's not one definition of what infinity okay, one. So these are six different possible definitions of what an infinity one category should be. In one of these things that you choose yeah. the one you want, give me the definition of infinity one category in one of these settings. 
So an infinity one category is a category enriched in, some, in spaces. What? It's a category enriched in spaces. That's one oh. possible definition. So like ordinary topological spaces, um, some Puschel sets, yeah, um, spectra. I mean, I there's know. hundreds of examples of infinity one categories. So that's what that refers to? Right. This is categories enriched in spaces. Okay. Okay. Out of those, you could also extract a quasi-category. So sometimes these people say there's a quasi-category of spaces. Oh. Okay. Okay. You could also build other kinds of examples. There are relative categories of where you just have the space, category spaces, and weak, you know, the usual notion of weak equivalence or some other one. These are all models for what an infinity one category should be. They're all equivalent, but you have this complicated diagram. And they're analogs of these models for infinity n as well. So these are some properties you have. There are model categories. So here M is supposed to be M is supposed to be a model category of infinity n minus one categories. There's analogs of Siegel categories. There's analogs of categories enriched in that, that model category. If you satisfy enough conditions, then you can build a good theory of infinity. These are so model models of infinity n cat. There's a version of complete Siegel spaces in, in, with values in a particular model category. Um, there's sort of n relative categories. There's a whole mess of different kinds of notions. There are various notions which are similar to complete Siegel spaces, only instead of mapping in things which look like this, you map in various kinds of pasting diagrams. This gives you a theory of theta n spaces, which was talked about in David's talk last time, I think, at the end. And there's also these, a version of these transversality sheaves. And here, are, here was the sort of known universe of, of equivalences between these. You have sort of constructions which work if you assume con Cartesian properties about your model category, constructions which work if you assume some Puschel properties about your model category. Sometimes they can be related if you're in a world where both work. Um, no, you know, known constructions that you iterate, sort of like building n-fold Siegel categories or n-fold complete Siegel spaces, they don't produce things which live in both worlds. So it's sort of a mess. Uh huh. Oh, uh, this one doesn't have a. This one's just just a relative category. Yeah. That's a fantastic question. Okay, and let's go back to the one-dimensional case. You know, we have all these different model categories, and we have these Kuhn functors, the Kuhn equivalences between them, and this diagram doesn't commute. That's a problem. You have different notions which are equivalents, but there's a monodromy issue. You know, you could start in one spot and come back. How do you know that that doesn't, that doesn't matter how you pass from, say, quasi-categories to complete Siegel spaces? I'm going to answer that question in just a second. No problem. Yeah. Two to the left. This. Yeah. Does that mean that you're assuming that the model category you put in is already Cartesian? Yeah, it's Cartesian and also satisfies some niceness properties that I'm not talking about. So it's, it has to be Cartesian. Then the resulting category is not a Cartesian model category. Uh, here is it, like the this is like the injective model structure and this is the projective model structure. 
if you can construct the injective model structure and your M was Cartesian, then this will be Cartesian. That's what that means. Okay, so this is the theorem, is that um, there exist four axioms which characterize the homotopy theory I'll explain what I mean. Up to equivalence. And so let's make this definite. Let's say the quasi category. Let's use the quasi category model structure. You would call it a quasi category. I don't want to uh, because we don't have a lot of time left, but I'd be happy to afterwards. Um, but you could do this in any one of the other models. So we could do it in complete Siegel spaces. You could say the complete Siegel space of infinity n categories. That's a great question. Let me come back to that at the end. Um, as, yeah, I'll, I'll answer that question at the end. So. Um, this is just capturing the homotopy theory up to equivalence of these quasi-categories. So it's more, yeah. And um, the second theorem is that the space of the space of quasi-categories satisfying these axioms. is B Z mod 2 to the N. So how does that help us? So in the N, N equals 1 case, it says that the space of quasi-categories satisfying the axioms is a BZ2. So what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to look at this picture, look at this diagram of model categories, and say, hey, model categories aren't the right notion of, well, I mean, they're, they're sort of, it's hard to see, you know, what's going on with model categories because they have a lot of extra equipment around. Let's take this diagram and instead of viewing it as a diagram of model categories, let's view it as a diagram of homotopy theories in our favorite other model of homotopy theories. So for example, each of these as, as being model categories, they're examples of relative categories. We could use the hammock localization. So we could view all these as some pushal categories, objects in the model category of some pushal categories. And then, you know, we're looking at a diagram of objects which are all equivalent. So the question of whether or not this can be rectified to an, a homotopy coherently, you know, commutative diagram is governed by the derived automorphism space of any one of these objects. This theorem says that the derived automorphism space, so this is a generalization of Toen's theorem. So, so in the case n equals 1, this is a theorem of Toen. And it says that the derived automorphism space of the hammock localization of complete Siegel spaces is equivalent, a priori it's a topological group, but it's a discrete group, in fact, it's Z mod 2. And it's really easy to check that Z mod 2. It comes from taking a category to its opposite. So then you, do, you can test it by just looking at some very simple categories. And you can check that, oh yeah, whenever you go around any of this diagram, those categories are the subcategory of those very small categories is preserved. So in fact, this diagram commutes up to higher coherent homotopy. The space of ways to make it homotopy coherent is contractible. It's sort of... Uh, you know, there's no, there's no choice in how to fill this, this diagram in to make it a homotopy coherent diagram. So if, as, a, as a diagram of model categories, it doesn't commute. But as a diagram if, of homotopy theories, it does commute. And you learn more because of this Z mod 2. If you change the diagram, if you had some other theory with some other wacky arrows, you only have to test. There's only a Z2 ambiguity, and that's it. So there's a similar result for infinity n. 
That's what Clark and I prove. And the Z mod 2s have a similar interpretation. If you have a, a theory of, of n categories, you can take the opposite in two to the n different ways because you could flip one morphisms around or you could flip two morphisms around and so on. So there's two to the n different kinds of opposite and that's it. That's the only ambiguity. And another theorem is that um, all these models of infinity n categories satisfy the axioms. Say nearly all because that's a slight lie. I don't know about this one. But everything else satisfies the axioms. So in fact, you learn that all these are equivalent and that moreover, that's, you know, there's not that much ambiguity in how they can be equivalent. So five minutes. So let me try to just sort of explain what the axioms are and, and um, end with a couple corollaries. So these are going to be axioms for a quasi-category. And this quasi-category needs to be equipped with a certain structure. So C is going to be presentable. And it needs to have some objects in it, um, which we think of as cells. So there's a zero cell, the one cell looks like just an arrow, the two cell looks like an arrow between arrows. So this is C2. So the first axiom is that every object of C is generated by the cells under homotopy co-limits. The second axiom is that these categories, these over categories of, ob of objects over the cells have internal HOMs. The third axiom is that a certain finite list of, of obvious co-limits are what they should be. And let me emphasize the fact that this is a finite, finite list that we're requiring here. It's not like an infinite collection of Siegel maps. It's like the binary Siegel maps. And then the fourth axiom is a, is a universal property. Universal with respect to 1 through 3. Which means that if D satisfies the 1 through 3, then there exists a localization. So there exists a functor, a left adjoint, going from C to D, and a fully faithful right adjoint, which allows you to view D as a subcategory of C. So you should think about this, oh, well, there's these infinity n categories, but you could also look at the, uh, the sort of n plus k comma n categories inside where you don't have, where, you know, morphisms are trivial above n plus k, just identities. 
that's some subcategory that satisfies these other axioms, that should be like a localization. So that's, that's the, what you should morally think about for this. But it's a little bit unwieldy if you try it, to use it like this. And in fact, I don't, think there is a, I don't think there is something satisfying these axioms. I don't think you can build the universal guy with the, exactly the way I've said it like this. And the problem is that while, it's, while you want everything to be built by the cells under homotopy co-limits, what you really want is some kind of canonical co-limit. And if you just try to use maps of the cells in, that won't work. So you need to make a bigger category. So let's define the following category, epsilon. So this is going to be a subcategory of strict n categories. And it's defined in the following way. So it contains the cells and it's closed under two operations. It's closed under the operation of fiber products over the cells. So if I take two objects, I can take their fiber product over a cell. And it's also closed under retracts. The reason this is a natural operation is that this property of having internal Homs is equivalent to saying that for all x, the functor which says cross with x preserves homotopy co-limits. So this is sort of a natural thing to consider in, lieu, in light of this second property. So then this first axiom gets replaced by saying that all, for every object x in C that now we have a copy of this epsilon sitting inside C and we can ask for the canonical co-limit, homotopy co-limit, where we look at objects mapping, you know, objects inside C mapping to X. We can look at the co-limit of those objects and that should reproduce X. So now we have a, we've had to enlarge, we include more things than just the cells and but we get a canonical homotopy co-limit. Making this category bigger makes this axiom easier to satisfy. So this is a very large thing um, that makes this axiom weaker. So that's good. And that's, so those are the axioms. So this is the construction you can apply to any C, this larger thing? Yeah, you mean, so I'm, def I'm saying that there's this category, this ordinary this category. This is a definition of this What's guy. Say? It says that this category is defined to be the, category, the subcategory of strict n categories, which contains the cells. It's the smallest one which contains the cells. And it's closed under this operation and this operation. And it is a construction, too, which defines something inside C. This, the smallest. Construction, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, something that exists yeah. Already. I'm characterizing a particular category inside inside, C. inside strict n categories, and then I'm saying that instead of having cells in C, I need I need a bigger I need a map like this. So I'm oh, I'm changing, changing changing the axioms to make them yeah. correct. Presentability. Yeah, it's presentable. You know, and we have a map like that, a functor like that. So there, and there exists a functor like that. This is not the cells anymore. It's something bigger. Okay. Um, so, let's see how that am I over time? <laughs> Let me just list some consequences of these axioms. So. so what do we do? What do Clark and I do? Well, we, we construct 
a theory which satisfies the first three axioms and is universal with respect to them. So anything which satisfies those axioms is a localization of this universal theory. And then we go around and construct some machinery for testing when various kinds of theories are example, are equivalent to this, this theory, for when that localization is an equivalence, and apply it to a bunch of these cases. But even still, you can, just, you can learn a bunch of other properties. So you can learn that the thing I originally wrote is true. So, um, so facts. So the first fact is that the, the cells do generate, do generate everything under homotopy co-limits. Um, another fact you learn is that if you have, if M and N are model categories, which whose homotopy theories satisfy the axioms, and we just have a equivalent adjunction, so we don't know it's an equivalence, then you learn that if L preserves the cells, then that implies that this is a equivalent equivalence. So it gives you a good way to test whether or not, you, you know, even if you cared about the model category level, we have a bunch of functors, you might not know that a particular map, a particular comparison map, is a um, coolant equivalence. For example, there's a map, there's an obvious map between these guys, there's an, an injunction between these two, but you can now check that, oh yeah, it preserves the cells, so in fact it's a coolant equivalence. It gives you a recognition criteria. And then you learn a bunch of things by using other work, so RESC showed that this homotopy hypothesis is satisfied by theta n spaces, where this homotopy hypothesis says that the, the, um, the, uh, it says that the, uh, the n groupoids, or let me say the k groupoids in theta n spaces are the same as k types. So as a corollary, this implies it's true in all of these models. Another example is Jacob proved this cobordism hypothesis in one particular of these models, the n-fold complete Siegel spaces. And so you learn that the cobordism hypothesis is true in all models. That's true. So there's a symmetric monoidal variant of all of this. And there are lots of variants that you could ask about. For example, you could try to axiomatize. There's a lot of new directions. The, the symmetric monoidal theory just works exactly the same way. Um, you could try to axiomatize um, things like dualizable infi you know, infinity n categories. That's a little bit more interesting. Um, so I'm Hopefully that will be a good thing to test with these transversality sheaves of David's. So that's probably, I'm over time already, so maybe this is a good time to stop. Questions? Uh, I mean, you you're right, I forgot to answer that. So uh, the question was, um, okay, this is great. We're, we're axiomatizing the, uh, the homotopy theory of infinity n categories. Maybe you consider that the infinity one category of infinity n categories. But really, there should be, we should be trying to axiomatize the infinity n plus one category of infinity n categories. So, one model for the infinity n plus one category of infinity n categories would be a category enriched in infinity n categories. It's sort of what you learn from this kind of a, a model. And one of the axioms 
uh, says that you have internal HOMs for these over categories. So one instance of that is when you look at the zero cell. So that's maps to the terminal object. That means that you have internal HOMs in C. So given any two objects, there is an in, there's a HOM, an inner HOM of infinity, there's an infinity N category of functors between them. So this, these axioms, and that gives you a canonical infinity, that uh, uh, gives you a canonical category enriched in infinity N categories, but enriched in a sort of weak sense, so you need to use one of these other models. So it's true that you, that we're only axiomatizing the infinity um, one category, but as a consequence, you learn that the axiomization of the infinity n plus one category comes along for free. As long as you insist that, well, your HOMs, your, 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 your spaces of infinity, you know, of, uh, your infinity n categories of functors, they should be some kind of internal HOM. Then it's determined by the underlying infinity one category. I forgot what this phrase internal HOM means. So it means that that maps from X into HOM, the internal HOM, from Y to Z is the same thing as maps from X cross Y into Z. So it's sort of a Cartesian internal HOM in this case. That's what I, that's what I mean. Uh, yeah. Um, so you said this has a um, symmetric monoidal analog. Uh, that's a great question, and I don't know. Um, I don't know. The, the the question was, can we do enriched infinity? Uh, you know, so I said there was an analog of symmetric monoidal, but can we do an enriched version of this for enriched over some infinity n category? That's a great question. Some of this works. Some of these models, so these ones, they work whenever you replace spaces get replaced with any sort of infinity topos or any kind of n topos or maybe some other types of categories which are similar. So this came up in some examples during this workshop. So people were talking about, well, instead of talking about categories of, of manifolds, you're talking about categories which are sort of internal to sheaves over the site of smooth manifolds or other kinds of things. So those are examples of higher categories over a different kind of topos instead of sets or instead of, of, uh, instead of um, groupoids or spaces, you replace it with uh, some kind of sheaves on some site. So these models work and there's a similar axiomization whenever, if you replace spaces with these guys, I, believe, I think. Um, I have, there's one technical thing I have to check. Um, at least the first, you can write down axioms, let me say that. <laughs> but the space theorem is not quite there. Um, so it's, I think it's a very interesting open question as to how to do this for enriched stuff. And if you're not something like this, if you're like a monoidal category like chain complexes with a tensor product or spectra with a smash product, then I have no idea, but people are thinking about that. Oh, yeah. How is um, a homotopy theory of infinity and categories related to um, some notion that one might make up for n spaces? Which are internal n categories in top. Internal n categories in topological spaces where your composition is strict? Yeah, let's just say, I mean, ignoring this. Um, how are these related? I mean, there's certainly a similarity. I mean, you're, you're having spaces where you have various kinds of compositions. It's sort of for these. For these guys, it's sort of like your compositions are allowed to be only homotopy, infinitely homotopy coherent in some precise way. I don't know if there's a model which uses strict internal topological categories or not. So I think that's an interesting thing. Yeah. I have a question about what's written on that board there. Yes. Exactly four arrows from sequential categories to quasi categories? No, there's a whole bunch. So there's one which is constructed by. Um, so the question, the question was about this board, and Jacob asked whether there was exactly four arrows from categories to quasi-categories, and I said, no, that was just supposed to indicate that there's a bunch of arrows. So there's, um, so Joyal constructed one arrow, 
um, from simplicial categories to quasi categories. Your construct, the construction that's in your book, this one by, that uses this um, <coughs> this uh, homotopy coherent resolution by Porter and Cordier, that gives you a different arrow. And then um, Dan Duggar and David Spivak gave a construction that produces a whole family of, of arrows like this that are all different, but somehow equivalent. Um, so there's just you know, there's an infinite number of arrows that go down. <coughs> right, and so the, the point is you want to know that, okay, if you have a bunch of these different constructions, you want to know that they somehow are the same. It doesn't matter which arrow you choose. That's, and so it doesn't. Yeah. So <coughs> ordinary good old homotopy theory mm -hmm. started in the 30s or 20s. Mm -hmm. Started with the idea of topological spaces, and there's this thing called the unit interval. Mm -hmm. They need to find homotopies by crossing yeah. with the unit interval. And then I've seen reference to various abstract constructions where you refer to having some category of length through homotopy theory, and you, you find the interval, so mm -hmm. to speak, and then you axiomatize that. How does such a picture fit into this picture? So I'm not going to remember what the it does it, it fits as part of the story. So um, suppose you're in a Quillen model category where you have two points and you have one point. And one of the axioms says that you can factor this unique map into an inclusion, a cofibration, followed by a uh, vibration which is a homotopy equivalence. And this object acts very much like an interval. And in many cases, if your objects are sort of nice enough, then you can reconstruct sort of a usual kind of homotopy theory analogous to what you're saying, un given the right kind of conditions on your, your model category and, and the objects that you're considering. So that kind of is part of the story. With this kind of abstraction, it says that, well, that's not the fundamental part of the story. There's sort of well, other machinery. First level, anyway. Yeah, and it would be harder to use that to kind of axiomatize these infinity n categories. What? It would be hard to, to promote this idea to these infinity n categories. You can get some mileage using these internal HOMs. And, you know, part of the problem is using this to access the higher, the higher information is, is difficult. You can, you can also say, okay, well, we can construct suspension and loop things, and that allows us to get our hands on the higher the higher homotopical. You put a simplex in there also. Yeah, you could try to, to do a different. Does that fit with that cat delta up there? Yeah. Maybe. I'm not sure. Okay. Any other questions? Well, let's play Chris again. <laughs>